Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Oh, try that one. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat This is really uh, the practice for the wonderful feast that we're going to celebrate this afternoon. It really starts tonight at sundown, but we always kind of get our start a little early around here, don't we? So this is the time we can gather together uh, right after our Shabbat morning service. All are welcome to come celebrate with us. And we are going to have a wonderful Shavuot celebration. We're even going to be able to see the words from the Torah. So there'll be a lot of fun things we'll do this afternoon. Uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, looking at the Aseret uh, Brot. And so we are going to roll the scroll back to Shemot and look at that as a group this afternoon. All right, so if we all have our outline today, I want to make sure we can get into the Word of God together and uh, look at this wonderful portion of scripture. We're in a new book today called Bimit Bar, which is the book of Numbers. And so we're in a message today called From Mountaintop to Desert Tent. Can you say that with me? From Mountaintop to Desert Tent. And uh, we're looking at Bimit Bar Numbers. Oh, I have a little typo there. Yeah, it looks like it's, it should be one one. Yeah, it should be one one. I have the wrong numbers there. But it should be numbers uh, one one through. Can someone give me the closing verse on that? I think chapter four, verse 20. 20. Okay, so that's what it should say. Hosea or Hosea 2, 1 through 22. And 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20. Now, I tell you why I have that typo. I often have a few little errors. Here and there, once in a while. How many know, know that nobody's perfect? But we all strive to get up that mountain for perfection. But I've made a major mountain in my life. Ten years of a beautiful, wonderful marriage and our anniversary. Me and Magali Balechi, we are excited. We were able to spend the last couple of days in uh, Orange County and Temecula having a grand time the last couple of 48 hours. And my beautiful wife there, wave, wave to the congregation. Today in the afternoon, you can get to know her. When you want to say her name, Magali, just say my golly. Yeah. <laughs> the easy way to remember it. And uh, her name in Hebrew, Magal, means sickle. Magali means my sickle. So she's my sickle if she needs to cut me down at any time I let her. Because she trims my bushes for me. She makes sure I'm nice and presentable and I say the right words. She corrects me when I, when I want to say something harsh. She says, no, honey, say it this way. And how many know if it wasn't for the women in our life, where would us men be? Yeah. Oh, come on, guys. You deserve a big, uh, a, a moment to just get in alignment with your wife and say, Amen. Amen. Oh, come on, guys. Amen. There you go. All right. And if you're a young man, say it about your mom. Amen. Because where would you be without your mothers? Amen. 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 And so we're looking at um, a wonderful portion of scripture today. Uh, we also see um, Hosea 2 1 through 22. Uh, had the Breed Out Shah reading of 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20, talked about the unity that should be in the body of Messiah. Today we want to say a hearty welcome to all of our first time guests. Okay. Your visitor ones after that, your Mishpoka, and everyone that came back to the house of the Lord, we should say welcome. Bruchim Habayim. Today we will take a little gleaning from um, something the Lord's been stirring in my heart in reference to the portion, but also specifically to Shavuot and where I believe God's taking us as a congregation. Numbers 1.1 1, 1 says, Adonai spoke to Moshe in the Sinai desert. What mountain? Sinai. Sinai. That Sinai area, peninsula, or wilderness area. Notice that God spoke at Sinai, but he also spoke in the tent of meeting. Before you get any further, you have two forms of communication. You have one on the mountaintop, and one in the tabernacle for the tent of meeting. So today, from the mountaintop experience down to the desert tent, we want to make Torah accessible to everyone. We want everyone to learn from Torah because we believe it's the blueprint for the rest of the Bible. Even Messiah coming was to fulfill the Torah and the prophets, never to destroy, never to add or take away from the Torah, but to always fulfill Torah. You and I should want to fulfill Torah by letting love for God in our heart, soul, and strength show our, our, our love for his oneness and who he is, but also the oneness we should show with our fellow neighbor, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Because when you look at Torah through those two tablets, loving God, loving your neighbor, the two tablets, or the ten words, 
Or the 613 become easy when you have one heart for God. And that same heart for God, like the rounding of the two tablets, right, can be the same heart you have for your neighbor. Wouldn't that be great if we loved our brother who we can see just in the same way we love our, our, our God who we can't see? Because you can't see God. He's invisible. But you can see the person that's right there. So we've been praying for you, Thea. We've been praying even for Mary Lou. We heard about her accident. We've been praying for um, Esther. You heard the stints that were put in her heart. We're praying for the people in our congregation. But let me tell you what my prayer is. My prayer is that every single person that comes here and calls this at some time during the month, the year, the week, they call this their habitation, their house of worship, their house of study, that this would become your yeshiva, your place to, do, to not just be a follower, but to become a disciple of Messiah and ultimately rise up in the gift that God has called you to rise up in. Amen. Amen. Oh, okay. I'm happy with you. I think that's a good agenda. Now, let me tell you what I've been specifically challenged about. The Lord's been showing me that sometimes because I want to give you a seven-course meal, I almost put everything in my message. I mean, I throw the kitchen sink in there. I mean, I even throw a little Spanish, a little Italian, a little uh, Greek in there. I, give, I try to give you everything. I, I have two groups I'm trying to really balance on a weekly basis. Those who say, I want more Torah and have had the New Testament their whole life. So they want to get to the three quarters of their Bible that they've been missing because all they've had is the quarter of the New Testament of, the, of Matthew through Revelation. Guess what? I have the other side that says we get too much Torah. I want more New Testament. <laughs> and so I'm trying to balance over the seven going on eight years that I've been here. I'm actually trying to balance this, this need in a messianic congregation with a messianic Jewish expression of our faith with Hebrew roots that go deep into the soil. I'm trying to make sure the tree is pruned and balanced because if we prune, we'll have what? Progress. Remember last week's message? Yes. Are you pruning for progress? So God told me to prune the tree. And I was thinking, okay, whose branch you want me to cut? He goes, no, cut yours. <laughs> Lord, what did you say? I want you to prune your tree. I want you to cut back on what you give them and what you feed them, thinking that they're babes needing you to do everything for them. And I want you to start allowing them to get in the kitchen with you and watch how you do it. Yeah. Taking what you might have as nothing from the voice of God. And then by the end of the week say, I clearly hear what God's saying. I clearly know what God wants me to pray. What he wants me to declare and speak over my life, over my family, over my business. And take these principles that you have as facts floating around in your head. That you can pull at any time. And put it in their hands. Amen. A weapon in one hand. And, and uh, a, a hammer in the other. we got to have spiritual warfare, but we can know how to build our homes on the foundation of the scriptures. Amen? So I'm going to start next week with a new format. You're going to find even the bulletin is going to look different. And I'm going to actually give you approximately a 35-minute message, which will have a warm-up and a closing. But I'm going to give you 10 minutes of Torah, 10 minutes of Prophets, 10 minutes of New Testament, read to shop. Amen. What I'm going to train you to do is weekly and daily, you take 10 minutes of Torah, you take 10 minutes of the prophets, and you take 10 minutes of the read to shop. If you have three times a day that you eat, why not feast three times a day? Amen. Start with the Torah, work through the prophets, and see the revelation I would always fulfill in the read to shop. If you do that daily, promise me by the end of the week when you take your morning manna on a daily basis, like you take your vitamins, mm -hmm. you're going to come here with a double portion in your spirit. Yes. Yes. You collect the manna, I'll give you the showbread. Amen. Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to feed you on Shabbat. I'm going to show you the bread. Amen. So don't come with an empty plate saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, Rabbi, feed me. And then one say, well, he didn't feed me enough Torah. The other one says, he didn't feed me enough Breed on a Shop. Well, he didn't talk about Yeshua enough. Guess what? I'm going to feed you all of it. But I'm going to show you how to feed yourself. Because then you're going to find someone to share it with during the week. You're going to find someone to pray over throughout the week. And I'm going to give you six days of morning manna suggestion 
including verses to read that will prepare you for the next Shabbat. Okay, so it's going to give you all the readings for the next Shabbat, not the previous one. We're not going to backtrack. We're going to go forward. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to give you the readings broken down in seven-day portions for the next Shabbat, but then I'm going to give you six thoughtful things to pray about, to search in the scriptures. I'll give you a one word. It'll be a one word for every day. It'll be the word of the day. And in, in that morning manner, it'll be one word that I'm expecting you to look up in the Bible, you look up in the scriptures, you to research on the internet, and that one word will be the focus of that day. You'll even learn to pray that word over your life that day. Glory. And you're going to apply it. By the time you get here, guess what? On Wednesday, on Wednesday, the format's going to change. And guess what? When you guys come together, whether and sometimes it won't always be in the building, we're going to have, um, um, uh, we're going to actually kind of change up and give you a schedule for the month. But sometimes it'll be in a home, and sometimes it'll be in the, in the shul. But what we're going to do is we're going to get everybody on this page of Morning Manna. Amen. And the principles will be drawn from that week's Morning Manna because it's going to prep us for Shabbat. We're no longer going to just look backwards at Scripture. We're going to start looking forward through the Scriptures towards you too. I'm tired of the wilderness. I want the promised land. Guess what? In Egypt, you couldn't sow. In the wilderness, you couldn't sow. But when you get your own land to sow in, Oh, yeah. That promised land is going to reap a harvest like you can't believe. Amen. You're going to pray better. Yeah. You're going to study better. I'm going to show you how to study the Bible. I'm going to show you all the different possible ways to study Scripture and the different ways to look at Scripture throughout the next weeks. We're going from the mountaintop of Shavuot, and we're going to bring it down to the tent or tabernacle. And what's going to happen when it gets in this tabernacle, you're going to take it to your tent, yes. your house, yes. your neighbors, yes. your loved ones. Your unsaved family members and friends. And we're going to see some changes happen. Now, trust me. If for some reason I start to slack on this, you say, hey, Rabbi, you said oh, yeah. we're doing that. Because trust me, I'm going to be on my game. You be on your game. Amen. This is a one-to-one -one relationship, a win-win. Yep. So guess what? We're all accountable to each other. Amen. I'm going to be accountable a lot to my elders because I'm going to be training them on a level of yeshiva probably even beyond the congregation. But I'm gonna make sure everybody gets taught. Because what I don't want is us to be ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Amen. I don't want us to remain, remain babies. Yeshua shouldn't come back for a bunch of crying babies. Amen. Yeshua should come back for an army that's ready to get on that, that, that train to glory and come back on a white horse to take back what belongs to the Lord. Amen. Amen. I will try to refrain many times from treaching until it's my final point. But I'm going to really focus on teaching you the principles I believe you need to know. Now, today I've given you a little bit of everything about Shavuot. We're going to glean from it. You ready to glean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. The first thing I want you to glean from is notice in this verse two places of speaking. The mountaintop of Sinai and the tent of meeting. Okay? And then he records all the names. 20 and up for military service. Jump to verse 5. The key focus in verses 5 through 9, he begins to teach us, especially in verse um, 5 and 6 here. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, summon the tribe of Levi. What tribe? Levi. Levi. And assign them to Aharon. He is also the tribe of Levi. He is the Kohen. Literally, he is the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, so that they can help him. So Aharon is Aaron, the brother of Moses, Moshe. They are to carry out his duties and the duties of the whole community bef before the tent of what? Meeting. The tent of meeting. That's the tabernacle. In the performing of the service of the tabernacle, they are to be in charge of all the furnishings of the what? Tabernacle. Tent of meeting or the tabernacle. And to carry out all the duties of the, uh, of the people of Israel connected with the service of the tabernacle. tabernacle. Um, it says in verse 9, assign the Leviim to Aharon and his sons, and their, uh, and their one responsibility in regard to the people of Israel is to serve him. Now, as the Levites serve Aaron, mm -hmm. all of the priesthood serve the people on behalf of God, mm -hmm. and God for the people. So there are go-between. You and I, in a sense, spiritually, we're Leviim. We're part of God's holy priesthood. We have to learn how to operate like the holy priesthood. When we come into the tabernacle, we get a word from God. 
you should expect tonight, Monday morning, or let's say Sunday morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, for not only did God to continue to use what you learn, but to learn something new every morning. Mm -hmm. Every day, six days a week, morning manna, and then what happens is when you come on Shabbat, the double portion of the sixth day should lead to a yes and amen in your spirit. Wow, Rabbi, I was learning the same thing this week. Because I'm only going to touch on that which I asked you on the each day's word of focus. We're going to touch on that. So you're actually going to gun and you're going to know where I'm going for the next message of our 10 minutes of Torah, 10 minutes of prophets, 10 minutes of Brit Shah. You're going to know where I'm going because I'm giving you all the key words. Those are the key words we're going to focus on. Now, uh, if you jump ahead um, to uh, a little breakdown of the Feast of Week Shavuot, tonight at sundown officially is Shavuot. Shavuot commemorates the anniversary of the day God gave the Torah to the entire nation of Israel. Who did he give the Torah to? Israel. Israel. Now, was it a mixed multitude? Yeah. Yes. yes. So even though God gave it to the nation and the nation of Israel, were Gentiles included? Yes. Yes. Always. Yes. Wherever you see a Jew, you see a Gentile yes. grabbing a hold of the towels of their garment. Mm -hmm. Guess what? When you had Naomi, there was Ruth, right? right. Yep. And so every time you see Jews in the scripture, they're always to be a light to all nations. Shavuot is not for Israel only. Shavuot is for nations. It's for everybody. Torah is for everyone. Yep. Can you say that with me? Torah, Torah is for everyone. Now, look what it says uh, on the, the description of this festival we're about to enter in. It says, it's given to the entire uh, nation of Israel assembled on Mount Sinai. Although the association between the giving of the Torah, called Matan Torah, and Shavuot is not explicit in the biblical text. The holiday is one of the Shalosh Regalim, the three biblical pilgrimage festivals. It marks the conclusion uh, of the counting of the Omer, and its date is directly linked to that of Passover. The Torah mandates the seven-week counting of the Omer uh, beginning with the second day of Passover in Israeli counting. So what they do is they take um, the week of count, uh, Passover, which we know is unleavened bread, and that second day they begin to count. Uh, it says, to, um, beginning on the second day of Passover, to, to immediately followed by Shavuot. This counting of days and weeks is understood to express the anticipation and desire for the giving of the Torah. Do you have fresh anticipation today? Yes. yes. Good. On Passover, the people of Israel were freed from the enslavement to Pharaoh and Shavuot. They were given the Torah and became a nation. In a way, it's a birthday. Yom yeah. Ulet mm -hmm. Sameach for Israel. It's the birthday of the nation of Israel committing to serving God. The one, the word Shavuot means weeks. And the festival of Shavuot marks the completion of a seven-week counting period between Passover and Shavuot or we'd say Pesach and Shavuot, which is Passover and Pentecost. Exodus 19.5 is, is our theme verse to teach us about it. It says, now if you will pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you will be a what? A kingdom of Kohanim, this version says. For me, a nation set apart. We'll see what that means in a sec. Uh, it says, these are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. Moshe came, summoned the leaders of the people, and presented them with all these words which Adonai had ordered him to say. So who's a kingdom priest? What nation? Israel. Israel. Wait a minute. We already separated the Levite. I thought the Levites were supposed to take care of the dead. But the Levites and the priests are supposed to tell the nation, you all are a kingdom of priests. So we're going to break down this idea that, well, rabbi does all the teaching and rabbi does all the talking and rabbi has all the revelation. No, no, no. You have the teaching. You do the talking. You get the revelation. Why? Because what good is it if I know the word and you just sit there and let me feed you like, you know, the little bird that opens her mouth up and little worms go in? Well, I won't feed you worms, I promise. But what good is it if I feed you fish every day and have a big fish fry unless I make you fishers of men by teaching you how to fish? Amen. Yeshua says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. My job is to make you. Your job is to follow. Your end result, you will be a fishers of men. 
it won't be me being fishers of men. I have to fish in my pond, yep. but I'm fishing for you. Amen. And you're fishing for them. Amen. And they're fishing for somebody else. Amen? Amen? Yep. We're going to learn to fish together. Let's take a look at this famous statement. Mamlechet Kohanim. Say that with me. Mamlechet Kohanim. Vegoi Kadosh. So this is kingdom of priests and the holy nation. Mamlechet Kohanim. Vegoi Kadosh. God says the whole nation is to be. Mamlechet Kohanim. The kingdom of priests. Vegoi Kadosh. A holy goy. Only time you ever call a Jew a goy. <laughs> when you call him Goy Kadosh. Because Goy means a Gentile yeah. or Goyim nations, Goyim, uh, Gentile nations. Yeah. Now, Exodus 19.10 goes on in the portion to say, So Adonai said to Moshe, Go to the people today and tomorrow separate them from me, having them wash their clothing and prepare for the third day. Say third day. Yeah. On the third day, Adonai will come down on Mount Sinai. What mountain? Yeah. Sinai. Before the eyes of all the people, you are to set limits for the people all around and, and, and say, be careful not to go up to the top of, uh, up to the mountain or even touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain will surely be put to death. What would happen if they were trying to run to the mountain? What would the presence of God do? Kill them instantly. Because in their flesh, no flesh can glory in God's presence. So God says set a limit. Limits are for boundaries. So there's boundaries in ministry. There's boundaries in the house of God. Amen. So, for instance, if you wanted to redecorate, you just can't bring a thing of paint or put up wallpaper and just start redecorating. But you can bring your idea to the people that are at the base of the mountain. And guess what? Somebody's going to take it halfway up to a Joshua who's saying, hey, I'm up here halfway. Bring it to me up here. And then, guess what? When Moses comes down, I'll have a talk with him. He'll go back to God. He'll see if God's okay with it. And guess what? Once we check with the leadership, we'll make sure it's a good idea. Because every good idea is not a God idea. Amen. Amen. It might be good for another congregation. It might not be good for us. Amen. You might even bring ideas from your other church that you came from. Guess what? It's all great. It worked for that church. It just might not work here. Amen. Only because we have a focus. Right. And we got to make sure that the Jewish person walks through our doors and embraces Messiah in a way that is not foreign to him, but is easy to taste and see that the Lord is good. Yeah. And if we're going to put the right bait on the right hook, we'll catch the right fish. Right. If we're fishing in the right pond. But guess what? We also have Gentile people coming in. We can't offend the Jew or the Gentile. Right. So we don't force a Gentile to wear a kippah or to wear a prayer shawl. And respectfully, we try to keep where the men of the congregation wear, the talit gado, um, uh, gadol, the big talit. But we know in a Reformed Jewish expression, women do wear them. I don't get offended when a woman wears a prayer shawl. But I definitely want a Jewish man to embrace his Jewishness yeah. and wear his prayer shawl. When a Gentile says, can I? I say, sure, you can. You don't have to, but you get to. Mm -hmm. It's all if you want to. Today, the sons, or B'nai Noah, the sons of Noah, the Gentile nations that want to learn Torah on what's considered to be the seven laws or principles that all the sons of Noah should know, all humanity should know. You know what the rabbis say? But if they want to learn more Torah, let them. Mm -hmm. But let them start with the seven. If you can handle the seven, then you can taste and see if there's more for you. And there are rabbis raising up whole communities of non-Jewish people that are studying Torah, keeping Shabbat. Now, the only difference is they don't have the revelation of Yeshua like we do. Amen. Why can't we allow the Gentile to come in and learn at their level and allow the Jewish person to come at their level and have a real yeshiva here? Yes. People come and learn at whatever level they're at. The youngest children, to the oldest adult, to the wisest person, to the person that's most astute, to the person that says, I know nothing. I want to learn basic. Yep. Amen. 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 I really believe that's our mandate. So there has to be boundaries. The next thing we see um, um, in verse 13, it says, No hand is to touch him, for he must be stoned or shot by an arrow. In other words, they would even stop the animals from rushing, because even animals, that fleshly, violent raging of the animal coming to the mountain, presence of God would strike him dead. So if you don't want your animal to die, just keep him within the boundary. And uh, everything had to have a boundary. It says in uh, the latter part, it says because Adonai descended on to <coughs> it in a fire, its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. I don't think I'd even touch that mountain. <laughs> let alone want to go up there. Now, verse 19, watch this, it's very important. 
as the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder. Did it mention a blower? According to understanding of the text, there is no one blowing the shofar from Israel. It's a heavenly shofar. We understand it to be an angel of the Lord blowing a shofar like the one that will blow for Messiah's coming. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It says, Moshe spoke and God answered him with a loud voice. Adonai came down onto the mountain, to the top of the mountain. Then Adonai called Moshe to the top of the mountain and Moshe went up. Look at Hebrews' record of this. In Hebrews chapter 12, 25, uh, it says, there it goes. Hebrews 12, 25. See that you don't reject the one speaking, meaning from heaven, from the mountain. For if those did not escape who rejected him when he gave divine warning on earth, think how much less we will escape in the new covenant if we turn away from him when he warns us from heaven. Even this, even then, his voice, it says it shook the earth. Remember the mountain shook? Yeah. Shook the earth. But now he has made this promise. One more time, I will shake not only the earth, but heaven too. Verse 27, and this phrase, one more time, makes clear that the things shaken are removed since they are created things so that the things not shaken may remain. Therefore, verse 28 says, since we have received an unshakable what? Kingdom. kingdom. Wait a minute, what are, what are we to be? A kingdom of priests. We have an unshakable kingdom. Let us have grace through which we may offer service that will please God like a priest with reverence and fear. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. These are words straight from the Torah. God is a consuming fire because he shut up on Mount Sinai like a consuming fire. Um, Shavuot, also called Pentecost, Shavuot in Hebrew, means weeks from the word Shavuot. Uh, and it declares seven weeks or 50 days from Passover. The second day of unleavened bread when Israel was delivered from Egypt and traveled to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Words or Ten Commandments that were written on two tablets by the finger of God, Etzba Elohim, the finger of God. The original Pentecost was accompanied by a rushing mighty wind or storm, a sound from heaven or a shafar, ram's horn, and languages of fire burning over the heads of the Israelis as God communicated the covenant in the tongues of men from the 70 nations found in Genesis 10 as the descendants of Noah. Remember we talked about the sons of Noah. Found in, in um, it says there in Genesis 10, after the flood. Acts 2, 1 through 4 is not only the memorial festival of that day in the past, but the fulfillment of this feast of the Lord in the followers of Messiah. So Shavuot is not just something that happened back when God delivered Israel from Egypt and they traveled uh, for 50 days to get to Mount Sinai. But it's also seen in Messiah and his followers as in Acts chapter 2 verse 1. When the day of Pentecost or Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks had fully come, they were all in one accord in one what? Place. One place. And suddenly there came a sound from what? Amen. Heaven. In the Torah, it was the shofar. As a rushing mighty wind, remember that big storm that happened? Yeah. At Sinai, it shook the whole mountain. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Notice it didn't say an upper room. It right. said the whole house. Right. The whole house. God does nothing in the back, in the booth, in the corner of the dark. He does it for all to see. Amen. Remember, when God showed up at Sinai, everybody saw it. <laughs> in fact, the rabbis say everybody heard it, even the Gentiles. They heard it in the language of the nations, the 70 nations that were surrounding uh, that region. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, languages as a fire. The Torah says that God spoke with these languages of fire. These voices are languages of fire that were um, burning from Sinai. So here Sinai is burning like a fire and the languages of fire are like shooting off his divine sparks mm -hmm. from God so that the languages of fire are seen visibly. It says they saw the voices or the languages of God. So God spoke in Hebrew, but the language is divided into 70 ethnic tongues. Wow. Whoa. This is amazing. God spoke in tongues before the Pentecostal did, right? Yes. <laughs> and it says, fill the whole house where they were sitting. So there must be seats in the house of God for them to sit down. 
right. talk about it. Yeah. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, I understand Pentecostalism, but what I need you to know is Pentecostal or Pentecost is not a denomination, it's a feast. Mm -hmm. When we take it back to its Jewish root, it doesn't become something only some people get. Right. It's something that's offered to everybody. Amen. The ability for the Holy Spirit to take his Torah and put it on our hearts and make it where the language of it and communication of it comes out of our mouths. That's what God wants to happen for each of us. The chapter starts with the day of Pentecost, which occurred every year as a feast of the Lord 50 days after the second day of unleavened bread. And the day of first fruits of barley harvest, this countdown to Pentecost is described in Leviticus 23 and is exactly seven weeks, called Shavuot in Hebrew. Pentecost comes from the Greek word pentakonta in the Septuagint, which means 50 days. But as a festival, it is spelled pentakosta, or in English, Pentecost. Second Chronicles 5.11 um, actually explains to us, uh, if you look on the back of your outline, it explains to us some of the miraculous things that happened. Did I have that one on your outline? Actually, I probably didn't put it on your outline, but anyway, I have it here. <laughs> uh, Second Chronicles 5.11 says, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites, who were, were the singers, all of those of Asaph and Haman and Jedithan, it says, with the sons and their brethren, stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, and having cymbals, string instruments, and harps, and with them a hundred and twenty priests sounded with trumpets. How many? Watch this. The Holy Spirit filled the whole house. The revelation was that 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit. But it filled the whole house so that 3,000 got saved. And that was more than what was, that was just a remnant of what was really there that day at the temple. Right. So here you have this occurrence. Not an upper room, but the house of God, which would be the temple. The Holy Spirit comes upon 120, just like the 120 priests. Hmm. Not in Sinai. But now the next move of God, Solomon's temple. See, Moses built the tabernacle. And Solomon built the temple. Yeshua built you and I. His ecclesia, his assembly of believers. We should be like the priests of the temple. We should be like those that experience the outpouring at Sinai. We're supposed to be a kingdom of priests. Watch this. It says um, that there were 120 uh, in that latter verse of, of verse 12. So here you look at Acts 1.15. It says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number of the, of the names was about 120. Why do you think the Bible is putting that in there? They want you to go back to the law of first mention where there was 120 believers that experienced the presence of God coming down from heaven on top of them or coming down to take the altar offering and consume it and the presence of God filled the whole house. In other words, from Sinai, of uh, the tabernacle, and then to the temple, to Acts chapter 2, it's the same occurrence. The only difference is Acts 2 and Exodus 19 and 20 are on the same day. With Solomon's temple, what you have is the same kind of experience. So instead of it being locked to a day, it's locked to that kind of experience. And it's because it's trying to allude to the fact the same way God filled that house of God, God filled a house in the believers of Yeshua's day. Okay? So here we go on uh, to 2 Chronicles, which I believe you will find on the back of your outline. Actually, it looks like both of them are there. Yeah, in the middle of the... Uh, of the topic there. It says, when Solomon had finished praying, look what he did, he finished praying. What came down from heaven? Fire, Fire came down from heaven. What did it consume? The burnt offering sacrifices. And what filled the house? The glory, the glory of the Lord filled the 
temple. And the priest could not enter the what? House of the Lord. So what is the house of the Lord? The temple. Is there any question about that? No. no. David wanted to build God a house. But Solomon built the house, his son. And that was the temple of the Lord. So it says the Spirit of God is now manifesting in this way where it's filling the whole temple or the whole house of the Lord. And it says, and the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. <laughs> when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, like it did on Sinai, and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground and the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Do you see the type of shadow there? Yes. Everything's drawing, whether it's from the 120 or the spirit coming down like fire, or the languages of fire at Sinai, everything is a type and shadow. Second Chronicles 5.13 says, Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound. Remember, one place, one accord, one sound. Yeah. It says, To be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpeters and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For say it together with me, For he is good. For his mercy endures forever. Watch this. That the house, you're curious which house? The house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. What house of God is that? The temple. So let's go back to our text. So if you go back to Acts chapter uh, 2 verse 1, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with what? Accord. One accord in one, in one place. place. So you've got to have one place where they can all be together as one. Because at Sinai, what the Hebrew says is that they were all together as one person. And it uses a single, single term in the Hebrew instead of plural. It uses singular terminology as if they're one man. Because in Messiah, we're one new man. You hear me? Yeah. So he says... And we know that the, the portion, it says, they, suddenly they heard a sound from heaven, there was a rushing mighty wind, it filled the whole house. Look at verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Jump to verse 46. Because remember, it already told us. They were in one place, and they were in one accord, right? Amen. It says, verse 46, so continuing, wait a minute, you can't continue someplace you haven't been. Where did they go daily? They went daily to the temple. According to Luke 24. Where are they at now? At the temple. Why? It's a feast. It's a festival. Every Jew is commanded to not be in some upper room. That's your sleeping quarters. You now have to come to the temple. You would be disobedient. Followers of Yeshua. How many know Yeshua is not going to send to heaven? And all of a sudden, last 10 days before the Jewish festival of Shavuot that he told them to wait for, they're going to miss the whole day. <laughs> Where's every Jew going to be? In the temple. They're commanded to be in the place where God put his name. Look what it says. Con continuing daily. How often? Daily. daily. How often should you study the word of God? Daily. How often should you pray? Daily. How often should you have a, a, an experience with the Holy Spirit? Daily. How often should you remember where God brought you from? Daily. Continuing daily with one accord. Where? In the temple. So if they had one accord in the temple, it must be that chapter 2, verse 1, when it says in one place, one accord, we know the place. It tells us where they're daily at. In the temple. Don't let the tour guide tell you it's some upper room. You can barely fit 12 or 120, let alone 3,000, or tens of thousands of Jews that would have shown up for that festival. How can they all fit in somebody's little upper room? Have you ever been to Jerusalem in those tiny little houses and tiny little streets? You can't fit 120 people comfortably in there without being squeezed. Now, I've been to the Passover upper room, and I have been in there with 120 people, and we're jammed tight. Mm -hmm. There's really nowhere to sit, because you can't even squeeze 120 chairs in there. It's too, you got to stand, standing room only. So this can't be in some upper room. This is in the temple for every Jew to see, and every non-Jew that's come to the temple to see, because God's going to show his miracles the way he did at Sinai, the way he did for Solomon. He's going to do it for you and me. I love this. In uh, 1 Corinthians 19.20, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, 
whom you have from God, and you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. How many know, just like the temple, God wants to make you his temple to dwell in? Yes. Yes. Ephesians says something similar, but corporately. In Ephesians 2.21, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a what? Holy, Holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.16. 6, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? That's what our portion talked about in our Haftarah, our prophet reading. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I have two points today. Two points. Point number one, what do we learn from Sinai? We learn to live as kings, seated in heavenly places, and priests in the tabernacle. You see, God took us to the mountaintop, because mountains speak of authority, speak of kingdom, speak of, of kingdomship, rulership. And when you're in the mountaintop, you understand what it's like to be seated in heavenly places. He says you're seated like kings over the situation, over that problem, over that sickness and disease. You are seated high. He says if you'll humble yourself, I will lift you up. Yeah. Guess what, though? We can't act like kings and stay in the mountaintop all day. No? We've got to come down to the people. We've got to build a tabernacle. We've got to build a shul that is a place for everybody to come and learn under. Amen. This is the tent of the Lord. Yeah. We might not be the tabernacle of Moses, but we can be a tabernacle in, 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 in San Jacinto. Amen. We can be a tabernacle for, for um, him. And, man, don't ask me to change the name, but I almost want to call it the Mishkan. You know what I mean? Because I believe we are called to tabernacle together. And if we tabernacle together, two or three gathered in his name, there he is tabernacling with us in the midst. My second and last point today is live a set-apart life as a holy nation, as Hashem's chosen people. That should have the apostrophe as, as Hashem's chosen people. Live as kings and priests, but live set apart. Our life should be different. Everything that we should do should be different. And today I believe that we're going to start doing things differently here at some kind of Yeshua. We're going to be a model for other Messianic congregations. Guess what? We're even going to be a model for the church world. Amen. Amen. You watch. God will start sending pastors here. Amen. They're going to say, I'm not Jewish, but can I come and sit in your yeshiva? Oh, yep. I've been to Bible college, but can I sit and study Torah with you? Guess what? Amen. I'm going to handwrite an invitation to all of them. Yes. And I'm going to invite them. Do not do anything on Saturday. Thank you, Lord. Just Amen. come yes. and learn Amen. Torah with us. Amen. Would you stand your feet today as we exalt the Lord our God and bless? I bless you with the priestly blessing, blessing that all our men learned today in our Hebrew class how to say together, and we learned it as a group of students today. And next week is the priestly blessing, so we're going to be looking at all of the things in the Torah that will bless this congregation, this community. Would you stretch your hands toward heaven today? Amen. Be'asim lecha shalom. Amen. May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May the Lord Adonai shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace. And Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the anointed King of Israel, Redeemer of the world. In his name we pray, B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. God bless you today. May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace <laughs>